let's resume our conference with the very last session. Uh, the session is on advanced encryption. Uh, my name is Christian Rechberger, and we will have three <coughs> talks in this session. The first one will be on uh, time block encryption, as already mentioned in the last talk of the last session. And Yolan will give the talk. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here today. So I'm Yolan Romaye, and I'm going to be talking today about TLOC. So oh, we made a practical, a widely um, deployed time lock encryption scheme. And um, this is actually joint work with Nicola Gai and uh, Kelsey Melisaris, uh, both of whom are also here today. So if you have questions, don't hesitate to talk to us uh, after the talk. Um, so what is maybe time lock uh, first? So time lock encryption is really about encrypting a message now that you want to be able to decrypt in the future. And um, unlike the session's name, you know, advanced encryption, um, I'm afraid this is not going to be about the hardcore math, uh, you know, encryption scheme or whatsoever. It's going to be about very simple building blocks that exist for over 20 years. And oh, this can allow us to achieve time lock encryption. That is encrypting a message today that we cannot decrypt until maybe Christmas or three years in the future or just maybe tomorrow, you know, or in five minutes. And we've seen actually in the last talk of the, of the previous session, uh, quite a few of the applications of IB, identity-based encryption. And it happens to be the case that time lock encryption has a lot of the same applications. So you can also do uh, dead man switches, you can also do sealed bid auctions, you can also do uh, conditional release of uh, keys or something like that with time lock, except that you won't be unlocking with a given identity, uh, you'll be unlocking it thanks to the time. Um, and actually a very interesting feature of time lock is especially the case, it's the case for uh, like releasing documents with a known embargo period. So like a responsible disclosure, if you find a bug today in <laughs> application and you want to release it to the um, vendor, you know, you usually agree on an uh, embargo period of maybe 120 days, maybe 90 days, uh, or maybe you have to, you know, accept to never release the information, which would be sad. And so what happens if you get hit by a bus during the embargo period, right? Nobody will be here to release the vulnerability after a while. And with time lock, you could release the ciphertext and it will be released once the time has come. Anybody will be able to decrypt it. And that is quite interesting also for journalists, you know, as a dead man switch and so on. And I'm pretty sure anybody is, everybody is very afraid, you know, of that when they do responsible disclosure. Or maybe not, but anyway, there are a lot of other fun stuff you could do with time lock, like responsible ransomware. So if you're developing a ransomware, please use time lock. So you say, hey, your data is encrypted unless you pay now, or you will have to wait for three months. That would be much nicer than the current ransomwares that we have, right? So what do we have to achieve time lock? Um, I happen to work at Protocol Labs on the DRAN team. And DRAN stands for Distributed Randomness Beacons. And DRAN is an open source software that is meant to be run by a set of operators to produce together public, verifiable, random beacons. And this is quite interesting for lotteries, uh, for smart contracts, for, you know, whenever you need public randomness. And the nice thing about DRAN is it's building on top of, of threshold BLS. And that is very important for what comes next. Remember that. DRAN is also using pretty nice things such as uh, Pedersen distributed key generation for both key generation and resharings. Uh, it's, yeah, we've seen that in the previous session what it means, so I won't go into the details. And finally, DRAN has actually been deployed in practice for over three years by the League of Entropy. So it's a network that has been running to produce public verifiable random beacons. And it's been actually used in production since 2020. And yes, it is running in production with pairing-based cryptography. We are not Apple. 
So Dirac beacons, the nice thing about them is that they map to a given time because the league of entropy is operating under the security uh, assumption that there is never a threshold amount of malicious nodes in the league. And that means that as long as we have uh, uh, enough honest nodes, you know, we will be releasing a beacon at a given time with a threshold BLS signature matching the message uh, getting signed in the beacon. And that is quite interesting for time lock encryption because one issue we had with time lock encryption is that it's difficult to map, you know, to a given time. Like if you want your, your secret to be decrypted tomorrow, how do you represent tomorrow in terms of, you know, secret keys or identity and so on? And um, <clears throat> it's quite interesting because a footnote in the IB paper was mentioning that you could see uh, IB decryption keys as signatures. And that's exactly uh, what the BLS scheme is doing. It's using decryption keys from the IB scheme as signatures. And we have a live production network that is releasing threshold BLS signatures at a given frequency. And that is mapping very nicely to the time lock uh, problem, right? And so maybe a short BLS reminder, since we've talked about threshold BLS previously, but we didn't really see um, how BLS works exactly. So BLS is using pairing-based cryptography. So it means it has a pairing mapping two groups, G1 and G2, onto a target group, GT. Um, and to verify a signature, what you'll be doing is you will take the signature P uh, and you will compute the pairing of the generator of G1 together with the, uh, the signature. And a signature in the BLS scheme is actually just the secret time the message mapped onto the group G2 here. And that is thanks to bilinearity of the pairing equal to S time the pairing of the generator of G1 and the message mapped onto G2. And now when we want, where do we use the public key? Well, we use it on the other side here uh, at the bottom. We can compute the pairing of the public key of the group or, you know, if it's not a, a threshold uh, scheme, it would be your, your public key, together with the message. And that is by bilinearity also going to give you the same value. And to verify a BLS signature, we will just compare these two values and say, ah, checks out, it's a valid signature. They are both equal. And that's quite interesting because we have two different ways of coming up with the same value. And that is, you know, quite similar to what we're trying to do when we do a key agreement. Except here, there is a completely public way of coming up with the same value, which is computing the pairing of the public key together with the message. And that is not great for a key agreement scheme. You don't want any public information to allow you to recompute the same shared secret. And IB, you know, is actually working around that by just adding somehow the notion of ephemeral keys. I mean, that is not how it's described in the IB paper. I'm just trying to give you some intuition of how it works. But basically what you're going to do is you take a random value R, you generate an ephemeral public key PE, and by computing this time R times the pairing of your public key uh, together with the message, you will be able to extract by bilinearity R times the secret times the pairing of the generator and the message. And you can do exactly the same once you've got the signature of the message P by computing this time the pairing, not of the generator and the signature, but of the ephemeral key and the signature. And that will give you the same final result. And this is not using public information, and so it's sort of a key agreement scheme, right? And that is really like the gist of what we'll be using. Uh, what we do next is basically we'll be hashing that value to derive, you know, a fixed sized one time pad key and we'll be hashing, the, uh, we'll be exerting it with the message and that's it. We've encrypted something we cannot decrypt until we've got the signature P for the message M. And in practice, actually, because this is a lot of crypto, we had a few issue to do so because the League of Entropy was running Durand in so-called chained mode. And so the hash 
we were signing were the hash of the round number concatenated with the previous signature. The idea being that if you want to sign a round in the future, you know, like I don't know, round 10, you cannot sign it unless you know the previous signature for round nine. And that seems like a stronger, you know, uh, security assumption to not be able to sign future messages without knowing the previous signature. But it's actually not really useful in our setting because we are assuming there is never a threshold amount of malicious nodes. But as soon as there is a threshold amount of malicious nodes that are able to sign a future round, they could also just be extracting the secret key instead and signing as many messages as they want. Or they could be signing all the intermediary messages they need in order to compute the future uh, signature. And so it wasn't too useful in our setting. It would not improve really security. And so what we did was simply we, create, we created a new scheme which was not using chained randomness. You know, It was what we called unchained. And the messages that are getting signed are just the hash of the round number. And that allowed us to solve the issue of not being able to predict the future uh, messages that are going to be signed in the future, which are acting as the public identity keys, basically. Another problem we've seen is that DRAN was actually, I mean, it's not a big problem, but if you want to use it on, uh, in blockchain ecosystems or on constrained devices or whatsoever, uh, DRAN was running using the group G2 for signatures and the group G1 uh, for public keys. And this actually is how most people do threshold BLS, uh, BLS in general, because it means you have a small public key on G1 and a much larger signature on G2, because G2 is actually an extension field of degree two of G1. And also that means the mapping a message onto the group G2 is much more costlier than mapping it on G1. Uh, and that is a bit sad, but why people do it in practice? Um, it's because usually what you do is you have multiple public keys, multiple signatures, and thanks to the homomorphic properties of uh, BLS or whatever you want to call them, you can very easily aggregate these signatures into a single signature and you will keep all the public keys, you know? So if you want to validate, I don't know, multiple transactions in a block, you can have multiple public keys and just a single signature. That is very nice in practice if what you're doing is, I don't know, a blockchain. But we are not a blockchain, we're not doing blockchain here. So it was not too useful for us because we wanted each beacon, each random beacon to have their own signature. And so the easy solution was basically just to say, swap them because it doesn't change anything for the bilinearity of the pairing. You know, you could use signatures on G1, which would be much smaller. and public keys on um, G2, which are a bit bigger, but we have just one group public key here for the whole league of entropy, and we don't really care about the size of that public key. And then we have as many signatures as we have beacons, and so it's quite interesting in practice to have much smaller signatures. Um, quick digression, I guess. So what we wanted to do was a practical time lock system, something you could use today. Like you go on the internet, you say, oh, I want to encrypt something for tomorrow, and you can do it. And so what, we wanted it to be practical, so we wanted to be able to encrypt big files. And what people can do is either design a stream cipher or design you know, an hybrid encryption scheme. Uh, and that's just what we did. And in order to do it very easily without caring about the implementation too much, we chose to go with Age because Age is defining the notion of stanzas, which are basically just key wrapping a symmetric key. So Age is going to take care of encrypting the data, doing, you know, um, macking it, doing a, a head cipher on top of it whatsoever, reading it and so on. And we just need to wrap that symmetric key with our public key scheme. Um, and that's honestly something we can recommend doing in practice. So if you're developing a post-quantum scheme or whatsoever, a fancy scheme, and you want to deploy a practical implementation, you want to be able to encrypt tens of gigabytes of data, create a custom stanza for Age, create an Age plugin, and it just works. Uh, it's really nice. Um, I won't actually be going into the math details of our scheme because it's all an e-print anyway. 
So I'm sorry, this is the advanced encryption uh, session. Um, nope, this is a very practical scheme. So we'll see how it works in practice. And um, in practice, our time lock is relying on the Duran network run by the League of Entropy. So that network had a 100% uptime since we launched in 2020. And this is really, really nice. And it's also showing that threshold networks are really, really good at liveness. As we've seen in the previous session, uh, it's really interesting to achieve a strong liveness properties to run a threshold network. Um, we are currently releasing beacons every three seconds. That means you cannot encrypt something for, you know, the next second, unless you're, I don't know, you know, on the, on the multiple, not on a multiple of three, oh, like three minutes, anyway. Um, it has a solid distribution network to distribute the beacons. So we are using CDNs, we have Cloudflare, who is part of the League of Entropy, using their CDN network to push the beacons to their uh, edge servers. Uh, we are using ourselves a uh, distribution network based on Amazon CloudFront. We have a Tor uh, HTTP relay. Uh, we have Gossip Sub uh, relays, which are using a uh, sub -pub, um, gossip mechanism to publish the, the randomness for anybody to use. So it's a pretty strong, pretty solid um, network, and it's completely independent from time lock. So this, is, this doesn't care about time lock. This is about producing public verifiable random beacons to use in lotteries or to use in sortitions. You know, it's been used by, um, it's been like uh, certified by some gambling uh, companies to use in their PRNG. Uh, it's been used by uh, like, it's doing a leader election on Filecoin. It's being used, well, it's planned to be used to do um, sorticians to select people in Africa that would receive a uni universal basic income uh, through an NGO uh, to avoid you know, any issue with corruptions. Uh, it's, so it's independent from time lock entirely. And at the bottom here, we have the time lock client. And the time lock client is just doing basically IB encryption using as a, a public identity key the future round message that will be signed in the future. And it, is, it can outcode code the public key of the group. You can compute as many as you want. Uh, Pairing-based cryptography is not super fast, but it's not super slow neither. We can do a thousand encryption per second fairly easily. So that just works. And when you want to decrypt a time-locked message, you just need to pull the signature from the different uh, network for that round and you were able to decrypt it. And we did it. So we've released a Go implementation, a TypeScript implementation. We've already seen a Rust implementation pop up. Uh, so thank you, uh, Thibaut, for that. Um, and so you can use it today if you want, because we've also done a web demo, actually, which you can try now if you want um, on your browser or on your mobile phone. And it's deployed on the Jiren mainnet since March 1st. Uh, it's been in the work since February 2022, so um, we've done a lot of work to make it happen. Uh, we had it audited, uh, it's like live, you can yeah, rely on that, and that is pretty cool. So what remains to be done in practice? Um, well, it might be nice to look into post-quantum threshold signatures, post-quantum IB schemes, because it, there are not too many practical things there. It might be cool to see actual applications using it, you know, to do seal bid or meth prevention, as we've seen in the last talk of the previous session. Um, it might also be cool to be able to do some zero knowledge proofs on the content of the ciphertexts that are getting time locked, you know, that might be also pretty interesting. And sadly, uh, there are not too many implementation of BLS 12381, so maybe uh, we need to do a hack spec or whatsoever of BLS 12381 to push forward a bit with adoption. But anyway, uh, it's live, it works. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, uh, we'll be around and uh, we'll be hosting a randomness summit tomorrow. We still have like 10 seats available if you're interested. So yeah, that's it. Thanks, Ola. Anyone having a short question? So you mentioned PQIPE, um, 
Is there an actual need from your users, from your client side, or do you think it, see it as a, as a marketing? Not really. It's more like a fear, you know, because we've seen the NIST call for threshold, and it says, please do threshold PQ. But it also says, you can also propose new schemes that are not PQ, as long as they're kind of new, you know? So this is based on the discrete logarithm uh, problem. So it's using elliptic curves. So yeah, we've seen also the push for migrating away from, um, you know, the classical crypto to move to post-quantum crypto without doing hybrid, so without mixing together elliptic curves and post-quantum. So it's like, yeah, that looks fishy. Maybe it would be great to have other schemes to do the same thing, but that's it. Please join me in thanking Jolan again. <laughs>
So uh, this is, uh, you know, we, we need the low latency and fault tolerance that Quicksilver would give us. So the, the third option is to use uh, traditional public key cryptography. So here, instead of issuing a single key, a single master key, we issue separate uh, keys for every data center. And we wrap the customer's signing key with the set of keys of the authorized data centers. But here, as you can see, the, the storage overhead actually becomes pretty large, especially as we try to scale the system to millions of certificates. So this is, this is unfortunately not possible. So given all those uh, solutions that we looked at, we started to whittle down to some, some system requirements that we hope to achieve with our system. And uh, you know they, these are based on customer feedback, customer needs, as well as internal engineering goals. So as you can see, attribute-based encryption helps us with most of these, or at least gives us the building blocks in order to be able to efficiently implement this sort of scheme. The only thing that you don't get out of the box here is key rotation, uh, which you have to build on top of, of, the, of the system. So let's take a really simple example of attribute-based uh, encryption. So we're going to only talk about ciphertext policy ABE, which is the more natural form of ABE in terms of how access control gets expressed. So here we have a, a ciphertext that's encrypted under the policy country US or region EU. And as you can see, it can be decrypted by either of those two re regions. So we can also do negations, we can do conjunctions, and we can compose all of these uh, different attributes in, in various ways. So given those uh, characteristics that we just saw, uh, that led us on a hunt to find a scheme that would satisfy uh, several of these properties. So the first thing that we looked at was negation. So every attribute-based encryption scheme will give you monotonic Boolean formulas out of the box. So that includes ands and ors. But in order to find uh, negation or not, uh, you have to look a little bit uh, harder. And it's further complicated by the fact that negation uh, comes in various different uh, flavors, I guess. And you have to pick the one that's, that's most suitable for your task. Uh, large universe. So this re refers to um, being able to use arbitrary strings for your attributes. The other thing this gives us is it lets you uh, not have to define or not have to predefine your entire set of attributes right from the outset. And this is pretty important because imagine you get you have to implement a new regulatory compliance uh, policy. So you could just add a new new attribute. You don't have to like reinstantiate your entire scheme all over again. Next is repeated attributes. So this is just, yeah, ease of, ease of use helps you make more interesting uh, policies. Um, then finally, Pretty much all ABE schemes are presented in a form that's secure against plain text attacks, but we were looking for uh, security against chosen ciphertext attacks that we could implement in, in a decently efficient way. So the scheme that we uh, converged onto was the TKN20 scheme, uh, and it's based on the matrix decisional Diffie-Hellman assumption that's uh, an, an extension of the, the classic Diffie-Hellman assumption that applies in certain scenarios that uh, relate to bilinear pairings. And it's got this interesting thing going on where, uh, so that's, that's not really a real thing from like the, the scheme, but uh, the idea is that there's, there's matrices in the exponents and that leads to all sorts of performance overheads. And we'll maybe talk about that in a bit. Uh, and then, 
the second thing we try to do was do the transformation from CPA to CCA. And we were able to do this using internal wildcards and the well-known Bowdoin cats transformation. And finally, uh, we open sourced this into our uh, cryptographic suites library, Circle. Uh, this is based on, uh, so we implemented the scheme and we used our pre-existing pairings implementation called uh, for, for BLS 12. Uh, and uh, this is actually, uh, this is an important note here because you have to pick the right pairing curve as well as the right implementation for your use case because it, as it turns out, since AB is built on top of pairings, the, the baseline speed of your scheme is going to be very closely related to the, the speed at which you can do pairing operations. All right, so let's let's take a look at how the scheme is actually designed. Uh, so the first thing is key distribution. So in this case, uh, we have the core, and in the core we have this key generation authority that exists in a very tightly controlled environment. Uh, and this uh, this is this authority uh, holds the master secret key and uh, it issues attribute-based secret keys to, uh, to the various edge machines that we have. Um, and uh, the, the attributes that are presented here are validated by the key generation authority using a machine provisioning database that maintains a map of machines to attribute values amongst other things. And it, again, right access to this, this database is also very strictly controlled. Encryption is pretty straightforward. Uh, you, you have um, a customer uploads their, their certificate and the associated signing key and the, the certificate manager in the core encrypts that under an access policy uh, that the customer has specified using the master public key. It then uh, puts the places the uh, the wrapped key into Quicksilver, which is the key value store that we we talked about, and that uh, takes the key to every every machine. Decryption is a little bit more interesting. So uh, let's see. So we start off with a, a user that wants to connect to our customer's website. So they, when they make that request, they reach the nearest uh, Cloudflare data center. Uh, the TLS uh, termination service in this data center is able to, so it tries to fetch the customer's wrapped key from Quicksilver and tries to decrypt it using the attribute secret key that is present on the machine. If it's successful, great, it can, get the key, perform the TLS signature, and, and it's done. Otherwise, if it can't decrypt it, it sends it to the closest uh, Cloudflare data center that can, in fact, decrypt it and satisfies the, the set of policies uh, that, that, and satisfies the set of attributes that the policy requires. And assuming everything goes well, they should be able to decrypt it, get the key, sign the message, uh, so, in terms of performance, it's it's important to figure out what matters for your use case. So, in our case, decryption is really the only operation that we cared about. And uh, while we were optimizing some of our pairings, as so, well, like this this is the path that we tried to optimize the most. Uh, so, I'm sure there's like numerous uh, places where we can we can improve the other algorithms, but it it just did not matter too much to us. Uh, but uh, here we're again benchmarking against a uh, policy size of 50. That's not really practical for us. Like for us, typically it's going to be somewhere around three to four attributes. And uh, yeah, as you can see, it's it's still pretty pretty bad uh, compared to what what you usually get. So like all good computer scientists. We resorted to adding a layer of indirection to solve our problem. Uh, we did what is similar to um, public key encryption. 
uh, where you don't use the, the public keys to encrypt large swaths of data. We do the same here where we generate an X25519 key pair that corresponds to unique policies. And that's what we use to actually encrypt the, the customer's keys. And f further, uh, the, the policy key itself is encrypted using ABE under whatever policy is associated with it. And this uh, combined with caching at the edge helps us reduce the decryption cost by a really significant amount. Uh, and it also facilitates key rotation amongst many other uh, ways that we do that because it helps us um, not have to, because, because the number of policy keys that we have is much lower than the number of customers we have. Uh, this lets us only have to rewrap a small handful of policies as opposed to having to rewrap a, a large swath of uh, customer keys. Uh, if, if we were doing the, the previous version. So uh, in terms of challenges, uh, there's there are several of them. There's the reason that AB is not very commonly used and, and we ran into quite a few. So uh, the first, uh, first thing was uh, when we were, well, we learned that uh, a a useful and efficient AB schemes are surprisingly recent because even back in 2016 when we were trying to build the the older version of of this system geokey manager we weren't able to find a scheme that particularly had negation and was still uh, efficient enough so instead we sort of ended up simulating ab using a combination of identity based encryption and broadcast encryption but the the foundational property of ABE's collusion resistance, and that's also what makes it hard in the first place. So uh, this definitely did not have any collusion resistance, but uh, there, were, there were other number of other problems. It was very inflexible. Uh, it did not allow us to add new attributes after the original scheme was instantiated. Uh, it didn't let us uh, handle newly added data centers or uh, deleted or reorganized data centers, so on. Uh, next is the, the task of translating a research paper into usable and scalable code is, is very burdensome. And especially with uh, some of these schemes uh, where small, supposedly trivial steps can conceal very significant computational uh, resources. So uh, we, we had to watch out for that. Uh, choosing parameters, uh, again, it, you have to understand how different parameters affect your application. And we actually, when we were doing the, the transform from CPA to CCA, we ran into a, an issue in this area, but I don't think I have time to go into that. Uh, Pairings, of course, that's, yeah, they're, they're not standardized. They're unfamiliar. They add a lot of engineering overhead. Uh, and yeah, finally, the path to post-quantum maybe is definitely unclear. And there were a lot of other challenges, right? Like networking, um, the, the, it's, it's not, you, you, you can't just send requests to whatever is closest. You have to also figure out whether or not that other data center has the capacity to possibly handle it. Uh, this is just one of the uh, things, but there, there are several here. Key management, key rotation, the talk at Google really covered a lot of the issues that you have to think about. Um, operational ma maintenance and buy-in from other teams. So this is, uh, this is something that um, if you deploy advanced crypto, uh, to something that's as critical as like the TLS termination stack, then there's bound to be problems that maybe are not related to your service, but are related to other services occasionally. And when that happens, SRE uh, engineers are usually looking into this stuff and uh, it's the, the crypto part just appears as a block, black box to you know other teams that are interfacing with your uh, piece of the pie. So. 
uh, that can sometimes be challenging in terms of maintenance because you you have to keep uh, trying to explain what you did and why it's not the crypto that could is is at fault uh, and policy uh, yeah the encrypted data still lives in restricted regions so this is this is a very interesting angle because you, yeah it's not accessible in those regions but sometimes conveying this to lawyers and customers uh, can be interesting so we have a number of uh, features that we would potentially like to see in these schemes so quickly there's attribute changes uh, this is uh, it, it's easy enough to add new attributes but it's very difficult to uh, change attribute values or um, to deal with negation in these in these contexts. So, uh, and quickly, the dual system encryption. Uh, this refers to the matrix, uh, the matrices and the exponent structure that I talked about earlier. Uh, this this system is really good for creating strong security proofs, but it actually incurs a significant performance hit on all the operations. Uh, and sometimes things like negation could be added to schemes but they they're not so you know to researchers would be good to have uh, finally uh, i want to conclude by saying that in our case we had to use abe because of quicksilver but uh, i just want to reiterate what why that is a constraint in the first place so for we've built out this huge network we don't want to have a reliance on the core throughout the whole process um, so quicksilver gets us the low latency and the fault tolerance that we need um, and uh, quicksilver also has uh, parts of it have an interesting replication strategy where uh, there's communication between uh, different nodes that don't necessarily have to interact directly with the core uh, and they can share a data set between their their neighbors. So if you invert that principle, what this means is uh, using systems like ABE lets you build things like Quicksilver, which helps make your system more decentralized. And it also gives you storage layer encryption, which means you can share your data between neighboring nodes without worrying about accidental data leaks or uh, any any other uh issues because uh, as long as your your decryption key is secure um it's encrypted so yeah with that i'd like to conclude the talk and say that uh abe i believe is uh criminally underutilized in uh the the in building access control systems and there's definitely a lack of awareness in the distributed systems and database security communities um, likely due to you know lack of prior art and lack of standardization uh, in these in these schemes uh, but it's it's all it can also be a two-way street where it's hard to justify doing those efforts if uh, there's no no practical use cases so I hope this is a good example for anyone who wants to try to undertake similar th things but yeah that that was it thank you so much Thanks, Sonia. Any quick questions for Tanya? Yes. Uh, so first, thanks for sharing a compelling use of ABE. Uh, two questions. One, I'm curious about the ratio between the number of unique policies and the number of customers, like what order of magnitude that is. And then second, I'm curious uh, about how changes in policy are handled by the system or, or whether those happen at all. Yeah, so to answer the first question, uh, usually policies are, you know, they're, they're based on a country or they're based on like, a region which is really only EU because you know it's kind of like a country uh, but <laughs> but uh, yeah and sometimes it's like a negation so like not this particular place or something like that so uh, the ratio like uh, we also we have more demand for people who want to use it for for their countries than we can actually provide it because you know sometimes we uh, those countries don't have data centers that are large enough to be like the you know single point of failure 
or, so we want to ensure that there's at least like you know a couple large data centers in their country before we can add like a policy that just restricts it to them so yeah the the ratio is like yeah think think about like you know like the main countries that are large enough to support multiple data centers versus um thousands and up to millions of customers so so it's yeah. like ballpark how many unique policies do there end up being uh sorry what uh, in, in terms of like a rough ballpark how many unique policies do you end up managing in your system yeah i would say like 20 ish is what we have okay. maybe like you know uh, people trying to use right now um but uh yeah i mean it, it definitely changes and it depends and for the other question how do you handle policy changes so we don't uh, we just tell the customer to re-upload their certificate and yeah but you know potentially that that could be handled thanks okay thanks you in the interest of time we have All to right. take the rest offline thanks a lot tanya All right, so last but not least, we have a talk on context uh, committing authenticated encryption with associated data by a large uh, list of authors. And um, Sankev is going to give the talk. Let's see. Uh... Gears. Okay, cool. Uh, can you hear me? Awesome. Uh, thanks so much for the introduction. Yes, we have too many authors. All of them are awesome. I can attest for that, though. So I'm so happy to be here. Today, I'll be making a case for context committing authenticated encryption. Our story starts with authenticated encryption with associated data, also known as AEAD. This is one of the most fundamental primitives. It is used everywhere from TLS to cloud storage to end-to-end -end encrypted messaging. It enables a sender and a recipient with a shared context to exchange messages or an insecure channel. Here, the context consists of a key, a nonce, like a random IV or a counter, and an associated data, like a packet header. The key must be shared out of band. The nonce and the associated, associated data can be shared in band with the ciphertext or out of band. This allows sending encrypted messages to the recipient with confidentiality and authenticity. We have many schemes that achieve, uh, achieve these goals, including AES-GCM, Chasha 20, Poly 1305, and AES-GCM-SIV. These schemes are standardized and widely deployed. If you're using encryption right now, chances are you're using one of these schemes. Finally, these schemes have security proofs showing that they achieve confidentiality and authenticity, even in the presence of a meddler in the middle who can like, observe and manipulate packets. But in recent years, we've seen a surge of attacks on our use of AEAD. And these attacks target the most widely used schemes, like those mentioned on the previous slide. This is especially concerning because we've built protocols assuming that AEAD is a solved problem. What is going on under the hood is that these attacks highlight new threat models that deviate from the traditional model of a meddler in the middle. To understand these attacks, we need to consider a different architecture that is popular in modern deployments of AEAD. Here, a sender shares, this, excuse me, here, a sender shares the ciphertext with a ciphertext distributor, like a content delivery network, who then shares it to the recipients. Then the sender separately shares the privacy sensitive key with the recipients over some other secure channel. The distributor and the recipients implicitly assume that since they all receive the same ciphertext, that they will all receive the same plain text. We call this expectation multi-recipient integrity. This is the intended behavior. This works if the sender is honest. But if the sender is malicious, and we're using a standard AEAD scheme like AES-GCM, then the malicious sender can arrange for different plain text to be received. The malicious sender does this by crafting a specific ciphertext, nonce, and associated data, and picking two different keys, K1 and K2, such that, such that the recipients get different plain text. In this example, recipient A gets the image of a cat, while recipient B gets the image of a dog. This is, an, this is unintended behavior. And it stems from the fact that deployed schemes are not what is called key committing. Specifically, we say that a scheme is not key committing if it is computationally efficient 
to find two keys and the ciphertext such that the ciphertext decrypts correctly under both keys and produces different plain text. Most of the schemes that we use in practice today are not key committing. In fact, modern protocols like TLS 1.3 and WireGuard only support non-key committing ciphers. Furthermore, finding these colliding ciphertexts and keys only takes a few seconds on a laptop. To see how this affects real-world deployments, let us look at a simplified version of DGRW's attack on Facebook Messenger abuse reporting. Here, a malicious sender chooses a specific ciphertext and sends it to Facebook, who then forwards it to the intended recipient. Then the sender sends a specifically crafted key to the intended recipient under which the ciphertext decrypts to an abusive image. The intended recipient, alarmed by the image, reports it to the moderator who then gets a copy of the ciphertext from Facebook. Then the malicious sender sends a different key to the moderator under which the ciphertext decrypts to a benign image. This clearly breaks encryption. <laughs> so, excuse me, it does not break encryption. This clearly breaks abuse reporting. And similar multi-recipient integrity attacks have been found and patched in the AWS encryption SDK and in a pre-release product reviewed at Google. And that's not it. Uh, after those attacks, a new class of attacks was discovered which targets confidentiality rather than integrity. These so-called partitioning oracle attacks arise in a setting where the server, for example, knows a password, and it reveals to the client whether the password successfully decrypts a submitted ciphertext. So in this setting, a malicious sender can attempt to recover the password by sending ciphertext encrypted under guest password. Ideally, one submitted ciphertext should allow ruling out one guest password. But we just saw that we can construct ciphertext that decrypt under two keys. So this would allow guessing two passwords per guess, per ciphertext. LGR show how to construct in 30 seconds ciphertext for AES GCM that decrypt under 4,096 given keys. So this would allow ruling out 4,096 passwords per ciphertext submitted. The Shadowstock GDP proxy was vulnerable to this attack, and LGR show that using ciphertext that decrypt under thousands of keys, one can significantly improve the odds of recovering the password compared to the traditional brute force approach, which tries one password at a, at a time. Uh, this is for a fixed number of submissions to the server. And a similar attack was also possible on early non-compliant implementations of Opaque and several other open source libraries. To summarize, we have seen two kinds of attacks on authenticated encryption schemes. The first class, multi-recipient integrity attacks, violate integrity in multi-recipient settings. The second class, partitioning oracle attacks, violate confidentiality in password-based settings. And we discussed two examples for each, but there are many more instances of these attacks in practice. See the papers listed on the screen. To put simply, these attacks break the most widely used AEAD schemes. They do not invalidate prior security analyses, they exploit the lack of key commitment. So how do we achieve this key commitment? A traditional approach is to append a hash of the key to the ciphertext. A variant of this is currently deployed by the AWS encryption SDK. This approach clearly works, but extends the length of the ciphertext by another two lambda, where lambda is the security parameter and might require multiple primitives. In the case of the AWS encryption SDK, they encrypt with the AES GCM, but they construct this hash using uh, HKDF Shadow 56. So those are two different primitives. A more lightweight approach is to append two lambda zeros to the message and encrypt that. And during decryption, verify, the, the, verify that the two lambda zeros still exist. This serves as a makeshift hash to the key, because if you change the ciphertext, then the zeros would also change. This approach was suggested in a previous draft of Opaque, and while this approach does not require additional primitives, it also extends the length of the ciphertext by another two lambda bits. These approaches exist. They're, pro they're fast, they're provably secure, and they're already deployed in practice. So we could standardize one of them. And indeed, there are current efforts to standardize key committing AEAD schemes. A recent CFRG draft calls out key commitment as a desirable attribute for AEAD schemes and an upcoming NIST workshop on block cipher modes of operation similarly calls out key commitment. So I'll ask again, we could standardize one of the key committing approaches on the previous slide or some other key committing approach. We, but we fear this is short-sighted. To understand why, let's go back to the multi-recipient integrity setting. 
recall that if the keys are the same, then the recipients get the same plain text. And this is true even for an adversarial choice of ciphertext, nonce, and associated data. Further, if we use a key computing scheme and the malicious sender picks two different keys, then at least one of the recipients gets an error. This is exactly what we want. Then what am I complaining about? Uh, if we change the settings slightly, sending either the nonce or the associated data separately to the recipients, then the problem comes back. In particular, the attacker can choose the same key, but, in, but instead vary the nonce or the associated data to re-enable violations of multi-recipient integrity. This works because the key commitment only ensures that the keys are the same. And what we really want is what we call context commitment. This is a notion that we recently introduced to capture this more general notion of commitment. Specifically, we say that a scheme is not context committing if it is computationally efficient to find two contexts, that is key, nonce, and associated data triples, and a ciphertext such that the ciphertext decrypts correctly under both contexts. Context commitment is strictly stronger than key commitment. More broadly, our recent works introduce a large space of new definitions, which are in some ways analogous to hash function security. For example, at Eurocrypt later this year, we will describe a new AEAD security goal called context discovery, which is analogous to pre-image resistance. And traditional context commitment is analogous to collision resistance. That said, all these notions are implied by a scheme being context committing. So for the purposes of this talk, I'll focus just on context commitment. Unfortunately, not only do non-key coming schemes not achieve context commitment, but even our context even our key commitment countermeasures do not achieve context commitment. This puts us in a delicate position as we think about standardizing committing encryption schemes. Let's consider the timeline here. About six years ago, we already had the theory of key commitment for AEAD. Then in 2019, we had the invisible salamanders attack on Facebook Messenger. And three years ago, we had the partitioning oracle attack and the formal analysis of key commitment countermeasures. And last year and this year, we began developing the theory of context commitment. And so if history repeats itself, we expect practically relevant attacks that target context commitment to appear in the next few years. The point being, we should really target context commitment now as we consider standardizing new schemes. Fortunately, there are ways to achieve context commitment relatively cheaply. The most straightforward approach is to append a hash of the context to the ciphertext. This works but extends the length of the ciphertext by two lambda, is slow for large associated data, and might require multiple primitives. A cleverer construction is to replace a tag with the hash of the context in the tag. This produces optimal length ciphertext, but is still too slow for large associated data, and might require large primitives, excuse me, might require multiple primitives. A wholly different approach is to do a hash-based construction, like a duplex, which natively produces a collision resistant tag to the con collision resistant tag that co commits to the context. This approach uses a single primitive, has optimal length ciphertext, but is not parallelizable. So all these are pretty good, but none of them are single primitive, optimal length, and parallelizable. Attributes that we have been accustomed to by schemes like AES-GCM. So we've been working on a new construction that seeks to provide all these attributes and more. We start from a wide permutation, like Ketchak or Ascon, and we build a block cipher using Evan Mansour. We then turn that block cipher into a tweakable block cipher using XEX. We then have an OCB-inspired authenticated encryption mod. And finally, we integrate it with other useful attributes like nonce hiding. In sum, this is a single primitive construction with optimal length ciphertext and is maximally parallelizable. Keep an eye out for our paper. We are hoping to have it out on apron soon. But let's put that aside and let's try to answer the actual question in the title, right? We have, we've done lots of background, but like, do you need context commitment? We say yes, because while we don't have practical attacks that target context commitment, we're worried that we'd be missing an opportunity to protect protocols from future attacks. Furthermore, the additional, context, additional cost to achieve context commitment over key commitment is minimal. So I would like to conclude with three calls to action. First, build context committing AEAD schemes. Second, standardize a few canonical context committing AEAD schemes. 
And third, deploy these few canonical context committing AED schemes. Like in this talk, I focused more on attacks, but context commitment also creates opportunities. For instance, in the previous talk, uh, we talked about doing zero knowledge proofs over ciphertext. We need context commitment to do things like that, because otherwise your ciphertext, otherwise revealing a key to a, revealing a correct key to a ciphertext does not prove that you knew the right key. See our papers for lots more. And thanks so much for sticking around for my talk. Uh, I'm happy to take questions now, but feel free to find me around the conference at Hacks or on the internet. Thank you. Thanks, Anat. <laughs> All right, any quick questions? Uh, thank you for this. I'm really, really excited to see the paper. Mm -hmm. I love OCB. It's my favorite mode of operation. Me um, too. <laughs> um, when, okay, so you referenced the CFRG draft that's like looking at basically the constellation of AEAD properties. Mm -hmm. When are we going to be done with this, like, <laughs> this process of like, you know, thinking more and more about attacks and like refining our definitions? Do you think this ends? Like, when is, like, when, it, what is the, what is the ultimate property for AEAD that we need to achieve? I think we have, so back in the day, we didn't even have AEAD, we had just encryption, and then we had authenticated encryption, and then we realized we need context, so we went from AE to AEAD, and then now we're saying, oh, we also need key commitment, and then now I'm saying we need context commitment, and then I also sneaked in saying we need non-siding. And if you looked at the CFRG draft, there's like 10 more attributes that yeah. it mentions, like it talks about multi-user security, and non-misuse resistance, which is also another very important property. Like, ideally, I would like to think that we, these things will stop, but I don't know if they will because our applications are getting more and more complex and we get, as we start doing more and more interesting things, we need more and more properties from our authenticated encryption. So Makes I know that's a non-answer, but. Keep the symmetric cryptographers employed though. So that's good. Yes. <laughs> more papers, more jobs. Yes, please. So um, like obviously batching everything now is gonna be really expensive. Um, are there any cases where this might introduce, like where a non-context committing AAD might introduce a vulnerability where there is not a malicious sender or a sender that might become malicious after sending the ciphertext? Like, does it always have to involve a uh, malicious sender of the ciphertext? So, yeah, so it's, I, I used a very simplified model. One, another way of thinking about it, this is, you take a ciphertext, you send it to like some cloud provider, and the cloud provider sends it to someone else. Like, uh, it, you don't always have, it doesn't always have to be the sender themselves. Like in the partitioning Oracle attack, for instance. But like in that case, the original sender might not be honest towards the other pr cloud provider, right? Yes. Yeah, so then there is a notion of a malicious sender. Yes. Okay, is it like, but is there any case where a, uh, where this might happen when there is not some kind of notion of a malicious sender anywhere in the protocol. No. So if, if you, if you, again, uh, so like the title of my talk is Ask Your Cryptographer. So if your cryptographer tells you there is no malicious sender ever in our protocol, then you don't have to worry about this. Okay, so there's like a nice property that if we see a protocol where we're like, we're sure there's no malicious sender and there cannot be any malicious sender, we're like, okay, we are safe not actually batching this. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, last just, uh, just very uh, quick question. So I just want to clear the mod that the OCB mod that you proposed, it's not compactly committing, it's just committing, right? You, right now you're not pushing for compactly committed, so you're not using any collision resistant hashing, just uh, it's variant of OCB with negligible cost, but it's not compactly committing, it's just committing, right? Context committing. Uh, let's take this off band. It's, it's kind of complicated to answer okay. that question. Okay. All right, with that, uh, let's thank uh, everyone in this session.